Good afternoon. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, uh, colleagues and friends. With these beautiful sounds of uh, Ode to Joy, uh, Beethoven's Ode to Joy, which is the European Union anthem, we we'll welcome you to the European Union delegation in New York to our celebratory event, UN's 75th anniversary, um, under the title of The Future We Want, The Voice of Youth, Leaders and Artists. We dedicate our event to youth. Um, youth is our present and our future. Um, the European Union Youth Orchestra uh, are young artists and musicians who, who are um, our cultural ambassadors we're playing uh, Ode to Joy um, last year at the uh, Young Euro Classics Festival in Berlin. And uh, they were led by their uh, chief conductor, Vasily Petrenko. We will have a, another treat uh, uh, from the European Union Youth Orchestra later in the event, but uh, we will, you will have to stay patient to hear more about it and to hear what it is. Uh, we have engaged uh, United Nations Youth Delegates Group. It's the group from European countries. Uh, we invited them to, to tell us uh, what do they think are the priorities for us in the world at the moment, or for them. We want us to hear them out. Uh, they will give us uh, their inputs, their messages. They will interview EU and UN leaders later on. And we will have a special guest, Ms. Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, former United Nations uh, High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights, and uh, in a live conversation with Ambassador Olaf Skog. My name is Jelena Buic. I'm part of the EU team. I'm here with uh, Ambassador Olaf Skog, who's head of the EU delegation in New York, and we will guide you through this event today. Ambassador, to you. Thank you very much, Jelena. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, old and young, and everyone in between, thank you all for joining us. We are meeting virtually. It's not how we wanted it, but it is a small price to pay, I think, compared to the massive cost for so many all over the globe. And we stand in solidarity with the victims of this pandemic and their families, wherever they are, whatever creed they adhere to, whatever race, religion, faith, political preference, sexual orientation they may have. This is a time to come together. Friends, uh, today we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, and there is much to celebrate. Wars have been avoided, peace agreements signed and peace kept and built. Millions of people have been kept alive through massive humanitarian efforts, and many more millions have been lifted out of poverty, their human rights protected, education enabled, and economic possibilities created. The European Union, celebrating 70 years, is built on a similar vision of avoiding conflict and cementing trust among people. We have been supporting and collaborating with the United Nations in achieving all this. And we stand behind the UN in making sure that it delivers even better for the future. And no one has a higher stake in us getting our act together than the youth. Therefore, today's program, as Jelena said, will be centered around youth and their hopes and expectations. And we will do it against a backdrop of the unifying force of culture. Dear friends, from access to public health and education, ingrained inequalities, violations of basic human rights, to climate change and dangerous global tensions, this is an opportunity to step up and do better for the future and to act with the same sense of urgency that has made us adjust in the face of the pandemic. The UN was created in San Francisco with the hands hindsight of two world wars, but also with the foresight of the need for countries to come together and international institutions to support them. Perhaps we should look at the current situation as a new San Francisco moment. The UN system needs to be scrutinized and adjusted and reformed but it should not be abandoned. As the very broad surveys interviewing the youth around the world show, there is large support across countries and regions for more international cooperation, not less, which gives me some comfort. 
So there are plenty of things to celebrate today. We just heard Beethoven's Ode to Joy, the European anthem, and we celebrate the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth, whose Ninth Symphony is also a UNESCO memory of the world. The symphony is more than just a beautiful piece of music. It's also a very powerful manifesto for people uniting. And indeed, 2020 is also the 70th anniversary of the European Union, counting the starting point as the 1950 declaration of French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman to create a European coal and steel community, which became the forerunner of today's European Union. It is also the 10th anniversary of the European External Action Service, my current employer, which serves as a foreign service and to make the US, uh, sorry, the EU's common foreign and security policy more effective and better coordinated in order for us to be a more serious and respected player in world affairs. So here we are, a full and virtual circle coming together. The founding of the UN from the devastation of two world wars played out over the European continent provided the climate and inspiration for the European construction and that construction in turn evolved and developed foreign policy mechanisms designed not only to make the EU a more effective international actor, a force of reason and common sense, I hope, but also working in turn here in New York to assist the United Nations making it better today. To complete the story of our future, we must add human agency. I'm a strong believer in the human capacity to overcome difficulties, even those we have created by and for ourselves. But I also believe that that requires a strong sense of responsibility for our own action and choices, and an equally strong ability to be attentive to the needs of our neighbor. Thank you again for joining us. I will now invite you to watch a short but very clear message from Joseph Borrell, the High Representative for the EU Foreign Policy and Vice President of the European Commission. Unprecedented times require unprecedented actions, and we are indeed living in unprecedented times. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown that there is no safe heaven and that we need to stick together to find a way out. This is what multilateralism is all about. These are the founding principles of the United Nations, which is turning 75 this year, joining forces in our own interest, since our destinies are deeply interlinked. These days, with demand for multilateralism so high and enough so scarce, we can no longer take multilateralism for granted. Some are even trying to weaken it, or ignore the multilateral system, but not the Europeans. The European Union at its member states, we continue believing in the United Nations and we give it our full support. Because we know that a global system based on international law, on cooperation and partnership is the best guarantee for peace and safety for all. So, this year's opening of the United Nations General Assembly, even if virtual, should mark a change in pace, a new beginning, a chance for all the leaders around the world to abandon the rhetoric of selfishness and to show courage and determination in cooperating with our common house. The United Nations is our common house. Thank you, High Representative. Thank you, Ambassador. It's time to dive in the conversation with the UN Youth Delegates Group. As I mentioned, they're from European countries, and um, we invited them to tell us what are the three priorities they wanted to flag to us, they wanted to give their thoughts to us and share um, about what, what their uh, contemplation about these priorities are. Um, we will have a first priority um, now, and uh, it will be introduced by Lara Schumer, who's one of the U.S. delegates, uh, youth delegates uh, from Luxembourg. Lara, to you. Your Excellencies, Your Highnesses, Ladies and Gentlemen, my name is Lara Schimmer and I'm a UN Youth Delegate from Luxembourg. I have the honor to moderate this intervention by the UN Youth Delegates from Europe. In the name of all the UN Youth Delegates, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity and platform to make the voices of young people heard. We have prepared a collective message that we would like to share with you today. 
In the following videos, you will hear about the key issues that worry us young people the most. Make inequality, climate change, and include us. We hope that you will listen to what we have to say and that you will do your best in supporting us to create a better world for the future. Over the next years, we want to be able to look back in time and say, they listened to us and they made change possible. The crisis that we are experiencing has left us vulnerable in many levels, and the process of normalization does not seem to be one that requires us to just go back to our normal lives. Today, we understand that we have set step backwards to achieving the 2030 Agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals. Building resilience is one of our main common challenges, but what is not allowing us to walk in the same pace are inequalities different for groups, communities and countries. The effects of the COVID-19 pandemic have highlighted the weaknesses of different systems and have exposed vulnerable groups. Youth is withstanding a lot of its effects, but is definitely not holding back on focusing its energies in building back better. Inequalities have become normal aspects in the education system, and this is worrisome. School dropout, social exclusion, limited access to resources and considerable discrepancies between different educational backgrounds are just some of the problems caused by the widening gap of inequalities. The pandemic has exacerbated already existing inequalities among men and women, evident by the rise of domestic violence in this period. The Gender Equality Research Institute in Slovenia conducted a survey regarding intimate relationships during quarantine. It found that domestic violence is not viewed as the sole fault of the perpetrator, is common in our society, and not talked about sufficiently. We must, as well as our representatives, act for the protection of women's rights in practice, in everyday lives. We are witnessing a pandemic that affects all areas of the social life. And in this context, we must realize once and for all that the only tool we have in order to create a prosperous future is a qualitative and inclusive education for all young people. In Italy, those who come from wealthier families have on average higher educational qualification for reasons ranging from parental preferences to economic possibilities of studying longer and better. If we consider education as a channel of accumulation of productive capacity and the four as the main determinant of pain levels, it's easy to see how much intergenerational inequality can persist. Those who come from more favorable social economic backgrounds have more opportunities to invest in their education, finding themselves in an advantageous position of consequent remuneration level. As a youth representative from Sweden, I see the increasing economic inequality as one of the most pressing issues of today. To build a sustainable future, we must ensure that wealth and societal resources are equally distributed among the population. And this is not a problem of national concern only, but a global issue that requires global solutions, recognition and political will. Technology is a great tool for empowerment, but each coin has two sides. I think it's easy to see if someone doesn't have the digital literacy or the tools needed, then for them it's basically impossible to study or work remotely. And I can only imagine what effects will it have on our societies and nations in the future if only a few will have access to artificial intelligence. Therefore, I deeply believe that just like vaccines, technological development must be used for the benefit of all. More than one in five young persons are not in employment, education or training. Three out of four of these are women. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on national and global labor markets. People employed in the informal economy, representing 1.6 billion of workers, and underrepresented groups such as youth are among those who are disproportionately affected. This is likely to leave more young people vulnerable to poverty, informality, and different forms of exploitation. We heard very serious, but also inspiring messages and thoughts from a group of UN youth delegates uh, now I'm uh, happy to announce that one of the European Union leaders is uh, here with us today. Uh, it is European Commissioner Jutta Jurpilainen. She's the international. Uh, she's the European Commissioner for International Partnerships, and she'll be in a conversation with two selected UN Youth delegates. Uh, they were selected by the entire group. Uh, 
Artur Aheyev from Ukraine and Kristiana Stoyanova from Bulgaria. Let us hear uh, what the conversation looked like and um, I give the floor to Kristiana and Artur. We are here to have a conversation with Jutta Urpilainen, Commissioner for International Partnerships on behalf of the UN Youth Delegates. Commissioner Urpilainen, thank you that you have made the time and that you are here with us. I hope that uh, you will, we will find answers for the following questions that we will ask you just like now. So the first one is that according to the values and principles that the EU upholds, the respect for the rule of law and democracy should be a top priority at any point. So I wanted to ask you, what is your vision to ensure effective participation for young people in the EU and UN institutions? And how do you see the role of young people in them? Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I, um, I think uh, this question you raised is very important because I have to tell you that I still remember when I was campaigning uh, for this uh, UN Youth Delegates. I was the first youth delegate from Finland to UNESCO. So I also have my own experience uh, on, on, on that issue. Young people are not only objectives, but they are also uh, actors. So I would say that uh, one important tool to be uh, heard is these policy frameworks and, and different strategies, which also are now implementing in, in the European Union. I couldn't agree more with you for the things that you said. And now this connects with my following question, which is how can we educate younger generations to a new model of sustainability that enhances economic growth and is able to reduce inequalities? The most important thing is education. We really need to provide uh, access to education to all the young people around the world. And unfortunately, if we look at the COVID-19 consequences, we, the European Union, is going to invest more funding in education in our uh, our next uh, programming period. So I think, of course, a Green Deal, a digitalization, those are the political priorities for the European Union uh, at the moment. So we want to fight against climate change. We want to have a fair and uh, also ethical digitalization. But in order to succeed, we also need young people to be part of that process and how to do that i would say we do that through the education so as you have already commented on that not every leader is committed to democracy or human rights how a responsible leader of the 20s uh, on the 21st century should behave actually i would say that the future leaders should commit it to this uh, agenda 2030 so sustainable development goals, so that we are able to achieve those goals, but also that development we are providing is economically, but also socially and uh, ec ecologically uh, sustainable. So that there is these three different aspects. From the policy perspective, I think uh, that's, that's the most important thing. Dear Commissioner, earlier you mentioned about societies and nations that are very young and uh, with most of their population being either young adults or children. So if you could explain multilateralism to a child, how would you do it? That multilateralism means that we work together. That uh, there are different kind of challenges and problems uh, where we are, which we are not able to solve alone. Uh, I think, you know, for children actually uh, working together it's quite normal because uh, as a former teacher I also know that uh, that you know children they want to play together they want to act together so I think uh, it's quite natural for, for children to understand that you know uh, together we are stronger that's in a nutshell the the purpose of uh, multilateralism and, and the idea of multilateralism thank you for joining and it was a pleasant and sincere conversation thank you Thank you very much and it was so nice to see you and uh, 
you know, noticed that uh, we have uh, active uh, youth delegates in, in, in the EU and, and maybe one of you will be the future commissioner, who never knows. <laughs> <laughs> well, we will see. But Thank you. <laughs>
A lot of steps have been made within the UN, like for example the creation of a youth advisory group on climate change. However, we ask you to institutionally involve us. I couldn't put it better than in the words of the Secretary General himself during the UN 75 Youth Plenary of this year when he said Now we are listening and we are taking into account but this is not enough. We need to create institutional mechanisms that allow for effective participation in decision making. Thank you, you and youth delegates. I'm really impressed by your energy and your dedication to this and other issues. Now we're celebrating the UN 75th anniversary and it wouldn't be a complete celebration without one of the UN leaders present in our event. And uh, I'm glad to announce that uh, United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed is with us in a conversation again with Arthur and Christiana. We'll hear what the discussion looked like in a second and I'm handing you over to Christiana and Arthur. Hello, um, we're gonna have a conversation with Amina Mohammed, the UN Deputy Secretary General on behalf of the UN Youth Delegates. Thank you for joining. Today's world has the largest uh, youth population that we have ever had before. How should young people of today use their potential in order to fight injustices, inequalities, and essentially work to achieve the Agenda 2030? Of course, thank you very much. Great question. Well, first of all, you are the largest cohort that we've had of youth ever. Um, and it is in this generation that you will make or break many things on climate action, but also on, on bringing an end to poverty. And so using your voice, that's what I think is going to be perhaps the most important. And I've been seeing that being used around the world and quite effective uh, in peaceful protests, in actually being very organized um, in the way in which you put the issues forward um, that are tailor-made to every situation. I mean, what happens in one country in Europe is different from Latin America and in Africa. So my next question would be about food. Food is so much about everything in our lives, from our culture to our family. Tell me how food has shaped, influenced your life. So I see it as fundamental from the the place in which it's produced. So I think about those rural farmers um, and, and the women especially that carry this load. Um, and then I see that it gets to the table and how it gets to the table, how it's shared. Um, and uh, I also see um, the waste issues, which um, for me are, I, I, uh, I find them completely, um, I'm overwhelmed by what I see in waste when I see that there are so many people without. Uh, so I, I try to advocate for that, um, that you know really, that should be about the way we consume, the way that the food system um, works. Um, and we're very fortunate that we're gonna have that, um, that conference next year, uh, which will bring everyone and the full value chain of food um, into it. So what can young people, in your view, do to ensure every government respond to the SDG pledge? Well, first and foremost, you're already doing. You started by helping us to shape the SDGs. Make no mistake about it, it was your voice that gave us the ambition that we needed uh, for the SDGs. Odd number, but when you look at that, you see yourselves and your future and the issues that need to be addressed. The first six being the unfinished business of the MDGs, but basic rights. But the rest of the goals are really about inclusive economies. Um, they're about jobs, they're about climate action, it's about good governance and it's about the partnerships that are going to be brought together to do this. How you engage with that, many different entry points. As a teacher, Christiana is a teacher, she can engage with that by improving the curriculum. But in the other spaces um, are in the private sector, um, not to forget that young people are there. And I think that you can raise your voices within your companies to look at how do you change the business model, not corporate social responsibility, but the business model that goes green, that helps the transition in countries to go green. And I would like to go to the next, more specific to the UN topic. How do you think we can convince in the way member states of the importance of youth engagement? Really important question. Um, as we are UN at 75, it's a time for reflection. 
um, even more so that we see COVID. Um, a COVID is a crisis unprecedented that needs us as a globe to come together. Um, and the role of young people in this, because we've seen them on the front line suffer the most, whether it is out of school or it is the front line workers or dropping out of jobs. So I think that the first thing to do is have that conversation with member states to show the different context in which young people can be part of the change of the transformation and are actually an asset that we are losing if we don't engage them. So it's not a question of, okay, we're doing charity in this tokenism. No, without young people, we will not be able to shape a world um, that we will live in because it's their world. And, and so we need to have you at the table. The messages that resonate the best has been done by young people in this organization. So we need to expand that and to show member states that policy will remain on paper unless you find the messenger to carry that into practice. Yes, thank you. I hope this uh, interview will uh, have a massive outreach so everybody will listen to your words that you have said right now. Thank you, United Nations Deputy Secretary General Mohammed and Christiane and Arthur. It's time to go through to the third priority the UN uh, youth delegates have selected, and I'll give you a hint, it, it has to do with the last question that you just heard. And of course, as the last um, two times, we'll have Lara introducing um, the messages. Lara, to you. I think it is clear what future we want to live in and what actions need to be taken to make it a reality. So now, here we go to the last category of our message. All problems of our time concern the whole world, and us young people in particular. Climate crisis, humanitarian action, gender equality, migration, health cooperation, cybersecurity, disarmament, and sustainable development. Solutions to these challenges require multilateral approaches, as they can't be found nationally or through bilateral cooperation only. The United Nations is a way to work together to solve global challenges. Now that this institution has existed for more than 75 years, it is all the more important not to question the system, but to protect and strengthen it and its values in every possible way. When we young people see the dynamics with which nationalist approaches take advantage of our global institutions, we get scared. I get scared. We fear a world led on the cost of the less powerful, a world ignoring the fact that we are all connected and that everything is interlinked. But not to be too negative, quite on the contrary, we are passionate about the opportunities that build on the foundation of friendly relations. As young people, for example as Scots or Red Cross leaders, we experience the benefits of worldwide collaboration. We know that it is possible to spread the message of peace, solidarity and mutual respect. We are convinced that young people and our youth-led organizations, our transnational networks and global partnerships make this world a better place. With more civil spaces, funding and power and decision making, we could do even better and take over more responsibility for the well-being of this planet and its people. It is misguided to believe that states could not in the same manner peacefully find common solutions. Everyone should understand that cooperation and partnership means winning, whereas solo efforts and my nation first means losing. 75 years after having realized this, the paradigm of pragmatic cooperation is threatened. That is exactly what young people call for when they go on the streets and demonstrate for... Climate justice now! We know at least one thing for sure. A rules-based multilateral order is the only way towards international stability, peace and sustainability. What? Well, it's quite easy. Stick to the rules and work together. Easy, right? Stick to the rules and work together. We call on the world's leaders to behave to ally with the Alliance for Multilateralism and renew global commitments, to better finance the United Nations and build trust in global institutions. One way of acting must be to include young people and youth-led organizations in decision-making and problem-solving processes. Take it seriously, not for the sake of tomorrow, but already today. Stick to the rules. Work together. And include us. Youth participation and decision-making is important. Democracy is here also for us and the future is ours as well. So we want to be there when the decisions are being made. We want our voices to be heard. However, the willingness is to be on both sides. So the question doesn't stand if we are ready, but if you are ready. We can come up with specific solutions to different problems that our society faces. And you can't exclude these brilliant ideas just because the people that come up with them are too young. 
So these were the reasons, but you may ask whether we are ready for it. Are we? We are ready to take responsibility for our actions. We are ready to participate in the decision-making processes. We face specific challenges which can't be addressed without our voice and our opinion. Are you ready to include us in the decision-making processes? Are you ready to listen to our voices? Are you ready to create our future together? Are you ready for this? We are. Young people are the visionaries, the hopers and dreamers, and also often the doers of our society. We need to include them in decision-making processes to successfully improve the world we live in. Now, I want to thank you for your attention. These are our key points that we want to see addressed in the near future. Our message is clear and we hope you listen. All we expect is for you to take action. And remember, we are watching you. Thank you, Lara. Thank you, all uh, UN youth delegates, for your important, valid, insightful, but also uplifting messages that we just heard. And uh, we want to go back to a conversation with the United Nations Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed to deepen the conversation a little bit, add some more questions. We will again have Christiana and Otto speaking with uh, Ms. Mohammed, but uh, I have I have to. Say that I'm super excited, and I and I have to reveal to you that we're really close to listening to the music piece from the European Union Youth Orchestra, which will be announced by Ambassador Scope uh, a little bit later, and um, you will uh, from then on be in his good hands. But first, uh, let's hear out the conversation with Ms. Mohammed and um, Christiana Atter to you. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, one of the main challenges of today is climate change. But the 26th UN Climate Change Conference was postponed due to COVID. Uh, what will the UN is going is going to do to ensure that 2020 is not lost in terms of uh, climate negotiations? Thank you. Well, we're already. Um, thank you, Christiana. It, we're, we are already in uh, October, so um, a great part of this year has gone by. We haven't stood still because what we've said to countries is that COVID may have put a pause. Um, on our lives, but climate change did not pause. It continued to happen with veracity. And so therefore the response in terms of your COVID investments must be climate um, sensitive uh, so that the recovery will be greener, bluer, um, whichever we are, we are speaking about. And to do that, our socioeconomic response plans have put climate at the center. We have pushed for the NDCs to become part of that, um, that ecosystem of stimulus packages and investments that have been made at the country level. So not to forget and wait until after COVID to now take climate action, that climate actions can be taken now. Um, and so this year, um, the SG and his climate action team have uh, kept the harvesting we did of the coalition's work that we had in the summit last year. We're working with member states on those projects and those programs. Um, we created a climate, a young climate activist advisory group for the Secretary General so that he hears and that they take out the messages as well that are important to, to his strategy, um, but that they also have one of that group is on the senior advisory group to the um, SG. So they're not just got their own group, they're also participating in a higher level, um, the highest level that the SG has of his advisory group. Last but not least, we had a number of um, engagements in the General Assembly, um, which will all culminate in the Paris plus five commemoration at the end of the year. So I wanted to ask how a responsible leader should behave in the 21st century. Responsible leaders. Well, I think first and foremost, you have to have a set of values um, that uh, respect humanity and everyone's equal right. Um, as uh, my right stop where yours begin and yours end where mine begin, that is incredibly important, that we all have a, a right to live our lives um, that do no harm. It's also, I think, important that a contemporary leader um, inspires people uh, to action. We all know what is not working. We all know what shouldn't happen. 
um, but we need to crowd that out with what can happen and should happen. And so a leader should be able to inspire the can-do attitude um, and carry hope. So my last question is, if you could explain multilateralism to a child, if, even if it's your own, how would you do it? Trying always to carry everyone along as you do in a family. So that's how I would explain it to a child, is take the family context and maybe not just the nuclear family, explain the wider family of cousins, um, of grandparents, and on both sides, you will always find a child who will point to an aunt or an uncle that they like better than the other, but might not display it in the same way. So I think that's what it would, that's how I would explain it to a child and, and maybe depending on how old that child is, uh, end with um, seeing the United Nations as that global town hall for the human family, for our human village. And I wanted to ask you one last question, as you have shown your inspiration so far, what would be your message for youth for today? What would you tell them? Well, first, thank you very much. I, I hope that I've done justice to the questions that um, you've all put together so diligently. Uh, my message to you is about the journey. And you're, you're coming at a time when um, there are many crises in front of you, but you have never been more equipped to deal with those crises than now. And you have it in each one of you individually and collectively. And that's what you need to do to look at the individual difference that you will make, and you can, every single one of you can make a little difference. You can put a stitch on that tapestry of the world and it can be a strong and bright and vibrant one. But if you all put it on, that tapestry becomes so much more vibrant and stronger. So it is about your individual and collective action. Take it now, shape it, um, ensure that you're taking everyone with you and that you're not leaving anyone behind. Not people, not communities, not countries. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. I very much enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Jelena, for uh, conducting the event so far. And now you said you would hand it over to, in my hands, the rest of the program. That is a bit of a risky proposition, but I'll do my best. We are now going back to a cultural piece uh, again, but it's not um, something that you cannot completely relax because it's something that will massage your mind. It's a preamble for a solemn occasion by Aaron Copland. It was composed in 1949 um, in response to a commission from the National Broadcasting Company for the United Nations. And this dignified and majestic six minute piece for full symphony orchestra and a narrator was written as a hymn to mark the first anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the United Nations. And as the composer remarked, it was not difficult to compose for the words which were drawn directly from the United Nations Charter were in themselves inspiring. And of course, most of you know the Charter by heart. And if you don't, it fits in your pocket and it is a very inspirational text. The piece that we will listen to was premiered in New York on December 10th, 1949, in a performance by the Boston Symphony Orchestra conducted by Leonard Bernstein with the legendary British actor Laurence Olivier as a narrator. The piece is performed today by the EU's cultural ambassador, the European Union Youth Orchestra, and conducted by Leonard Bernstein's great protege, Marin Alsop, who also performs the role of uh, Laurence Olivier as narrator. So I want to thank the European Union Youth Orchestra's summer home and principal venue partner, Grafen Egg in Lower Austria, near Vienna, from where this performance takes place.
the people of the United Nations. Determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. And to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and of nations large and small. And to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. have resolved to combine our efforts to accomplish those aims.
Ladies and gentlemen, that was the youth uh, orchestra again. Uh, they are not just uh, amazing musicians. They also do uh, a lot of work outside their uh, performances to uh, build uh, stronger communities around uh, Europe and the world. Um, I hope that no one has missed that uh, one of the main purposes of the event today has been to bring youth closer to decision makers and bring the two together. And um, I'm uh, awfully proud now to have uh, with me live from uh, Dublin, Ireland, former president of Ireland, um, former High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Mary Robinson. And I cannot think of anyone who is better uh, suited uh, to pursue this conversation because in a way you represent, you're both a leader and if I may so say so, also an activist and you're the chair of the elders, but you also have an extremely youthful energy and spirit around you. So I'm just very happy to have this opportunity. And I thought, uh, Mary, if it's okay with you that we should just, um, having listened to the youth um, delegates uh, uh, for the last half an hour or so and their messages, it's quite uh, clear that they are very concerned about um, climate change, environmental degradation, inequalities, access to education. And they believe also that um, international cooperation is much needed. They say stick to the rules and work together. And I think they say that because they don't feel that that is necessarily always what is going on right now. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts about this. Do you share that those concerns? Um, you know the system, you're a former leader, um, and you uh, know what it takes to get the attention of leaders, but you also know how to work the system, so to speak. So I wanted to hear your reflections on some of the concerns um, that have been brought up by our youth. I've enjoyed listening to so many voices of young people, Ambassador, but dear Olaf, because <laughs> we know each other. Um, uh, it has been very good that they had so much time to express their views, because we need to hear that. We need young people not to be kind of sidelined to one voice on a panel that tries to say something, but it's not really getting through. I think this evening we did hear enough voices to get through. And I was struck by the concerns about the multilateral system. And, and they asking, what do you mean by the multilateral system? Because that's what the elders have been particularly concerned about. And we spent Monday and Tuesday worrying about a lot of the issues that the young people raised. And we came out today with a very strong statement, which is basically calling for urgent action to address multilateral, multilateral failings, which are exposed by COVID-19. You know, think about it. If the world had come together in January, in late January, when we realized there was a problem starting in China and had decided we will work together to deal with this, we would have done it so much more effectively. Instead, we've left every country to do it in whatever leadership that country had. Some have had good leadership, some have had not good leadership. And that's exposed our people to far more deaths. This is not good. Every country benefits from good multilateralism. This is the way we get the, uh, the 2030 agenda and its sustainable development goals and the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. You and I have both been closely involved in watching how that came together. That's good multilateralism. We needed it now for COVID and it is not there at the moment. And actually the UN, the Secretary General in the UN, frankly, must step up more. That's the feeling of the elders. We are very supportive but please step up more. Please call out governments when they don't, when they pull out of the UN or, or the WHO, when they do things that are not acceptable, call them out, you know, name names now. Um, you know, <laughs> it's got to that stage where we have to actually have a system where we tell truth to power right through the UN system. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mary. I think you're. I think you're very right uh, uh, about that. Um, the dilemma here, of course, also. Um, I'm, I'm. I'm thinking about another message that has really come through from our youth delegates, not just today. In every event we do with them, that you know, um, that uh, they want their voices to be much more, you know, not, not just heard, but meaningfully, and to be part yeah. of the decisions we take here. On the other hand. 
The UN is an organization made up of member states. They are represented here by governments. Some of them needs to be called out, as you said. Um, but since we are dealing with the global agenda, we also need to have have as many as possible on board and inside. But we also need to, I mean, let's re remind ourselves, the, the charter calls about we the peoples. Um, what does that really mean in terms of making sure that uh, the 1.8 billion youth of the world are being better listened to. So how would you how would you reflect on that? I have two ideas on that. One is the more formal one about the UN system. Um, I was part of a, a movement of women to try to get gender into the uh, UNFCCC, the COP system, because it was so male dominated, it wasn't very human rights. So we wanted to get gender in. And we got women ministers to come together with the heads of agencies of the UN at the time. And we got women ministers to appoint young women, indigenous women, grassroots women into their delegation. So when they did that, those voices were heard in the UN system. You are an ambassador to the UN for the EU. You need now to let your young colleagues, and I mean very young, on certain days be your representative. Instead of you, it has to be them. Um, I, I've had a podcast called Mothers of Invention, uh, which is all about um, a kind of witty way to address the climate issue. We say it's a man-made problem that requires a feminist solution. But we explain man-made is generic, it's all of us, and a feminist solution also includes as many men as possible. But we have decided that our last series, our last episode in this series, would be taken over by young people. So... Um, my colleague Maeve Higgins and myself and the, and the producer, Tamali, just stepped aside and we let young people, and by God, it's the best episode. Mm. I hope they're not listening because I hate them to think they were better than us, but they were. <laughs> That's the truth of it. It was a terrific episode. It will come out next week or whenever it comes out, but it's about to, I know that episodes drop now. I'm learning all this language as an elder, but it will come out and it will be a proof of how important it is to give that space now, more and more. You must do it in the UN system. You ambassadors, all of you, must put young people in there with full decision-making, and full power to have their voice heard. That's, uh, that's, a very good, uh, that's a very good and powerful message. And I think it's one that came through also from uh, the Deputy Secretary General saying that actually the voices of the youth are the ones that have really made, made a difference in the organization uh, lately. So I, I hear you. Um, I will uh, step aside <laughs> and, um, and take, uh, certainly take much more inspiration from that. I think, you know, looking back, having been in and out of this organization over the years, I think there is change. It's not at all in the speed and with the urgency that, that is needed, but I'm thinking about um, the role of women and how that started out 20 years ago, actually, with the uh, uh, resolution on women, peace and security much yes. uh, under a difficult circumstances, a lot of objections, etc. And I'm, we're far from fully, you know, uh, realizing that vision, but it certainly has happened a lot. Um, many of my colleagues, fortunately, are women uh, today, and that is also a sea change. But I, I think there is, it's time for a revolution in many of these areas. I think that's the only way to, to make that change. And I think as you and others have been saying, the pandemic is a wake up call, but not just in terms of the, all the problems of the world, but it's also a wake up call, I think, in terms of showing that when confronted with a very real crisis, we're actually able to do some pretty drastic and dramatic things that of course should have been done before. But we, there seems to be resources when they're really, really needed and when there's panic. So let's try to find those resources now to build back better. Yes, I, I fully agree with you. And I, I, of course, uh, as chair of the elders, I have to bring hope in my final message. I think this is probably now. Um, yes, um, we have to deal with the depth and severity of COVID. And it's worse than we thought. It's worse now in Europe, it's worse in the United States, it's worse in different parts of the world. And we're not sure what our exit strategy is even now. We're just hoping for the best and we're, we're coping. And governments are having to pay a lot of money. But my real sense is that we need to have the courage 
to understand that behind the COVID is the looming climate crisis. I loved the language of young people talking about climate justice. The more people talk about climate justice, the more we will get out of this in a fair, balanced way. So please don't talk about climate change, talk about climate justice. But uh, what we are aware of is that we're borrowing very heavily and it's scary. It's scary for every country. And for the developing countries, they need great debt forgiveness now, great debt rearrangement, restructuring. And I hope the European Union will come to the fore in being serious about that restructuring of debt for developing countries. But we all now have to also have transformative change. So we need to have the courage, where appropriate and smart and clever, to borrow again, because we are borrowing our children's money to give a safe and good future for our children. And that I think is really important. We need to have the courage to, if necessary, borrow that bit more that is very cleverly aligned with getting out of fossil fuel as fast as possible, getting into nature-based solutions, um, all of the things that we know about the biodiversity, the farm to fork, um, everything we need to do that the European Union is giving good leadership on, and we need to do it more. That's a, that's a good uh, message of hope, I think, but also of action. Um, Colleagues, uh, friends, uh, Mary, everyone who has participated today, I'm afraid we need to end it here. Um, I wanted to say that uh, we've listened very, very carefully to uh, all of you, young and old. Um, I promise that the European Union will continue and step up being a voice of and a force for common sense and reason and change, positive change. Um, I want to thank you all for your participation today, especially the youth who have been for your activism and for your engagement and for being such a uh, fundamental part in creating the program today. So thank you all. Be safe, be kind and um, be active.